mental health and video games. Seems like an obvious pairing these days, but unfortunately most cases seem to come to the same conclusion in their mechanics, that the mental health part is an obstacle, a challenge, or even a threat. Not that hard to believe in the games industry where one title copies another title that copies another title, and ironically not enough designers use their own brains. But if we were to look back, before there were so many other examples to draw inspiration from, well, that's when we must rely more on ourselves and look within. American McGee's Alice draws a unique element from its titular director. Beginning his career with id Software, McGee was a level designer for Doom 2 and the Quake series. So, for his first project to include similar shooting combat would make sense. What perhaps made less sense at the time was that the level design, McGee's area of expertise, focused instead on platforming through the world of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. But the end result in 2000 works wonderfully well, pun intended. The plot of the game sees Alice Liddell, the real-life inspiration for the character, losing her family to a house fire and being committed to hospital in a catatonic state. The Wonderland as we know it is completely contained within her mind, now twisted by the tragedy and her response to it. By using the imagery of a well-known children's story, McGee and crew were able to mine deeper for emotional metaphors that create an adaptation more genuinely mature than any other. Nothing to do with the gore. Idiot! Oh, my heart. The levels of grass and tunnels leave Alice feeling powerless among giant adversaries. The checkerboard lands of chess come alongside her surprise at finding structure within the chaos. The beastly Jabberwock flatly declares her survivor's guilt while surrounded by the still burning remains of a home. On that note, character interactions are also superb. The writing is consistent with a style of prose that invokes the source material, and the central performance gives Alice an air of passive-aggressive impatience with the trials she encounters. Not angry about it, but tired. It talks like I'm on holiday, Cat. Wandering about, having a bit of fun. The Oracle's an idiot. Even simple transition between certain levels imitates the casual way that one idea can turn into another. Shortly upon dropping into Wonderland, we begin in the Fortress of Doors. Literally, just chunks of land floating around in confusion. One of the earliest examples of such game tropes. But within, we find a school building both the last solid memories for Alice, and a place to learn what must be done next, i.e. mixing the shrinking potion. A little later, after we seem to be accomplishing things, the Mad Hatter strikes like an intrusive thought and leaves us in an even worse asylum of padded cells and machinery. And immediately on escaping is when we start to encounter what put Alice in the asylum the first time. It's just a shame, with environmental structures this creative and entrancing, that the very process of travelling through most of them is actually a drawback. That's more an issue with controls and movement, but it's noticeable enough to mention, I guess. None of this is to say that the combat feels out of place here. Contrary-wise, it is the point, forcing Alice to confront these emotions rather than jump over them and keep running. Basing most of the weaponry on toys and sports equipment helps them fit in aesthetically, but starting with a kitchen knife so readily available does not display a very stable state of mind, especially with no cooking minigames in sight. On the other end, one of the game's most powerful weapons is collected in fragments and requires the eyeball of the Jabberwock, a piece of her guilt that spurs her forward so as not to waste the part of her sanity that did not perish. The most common enemy throughout is, unsurprisingly, red and black card guards. Though it wouldn't be an Alice story we didn't regularly detour, so it has a couple other armies contained to the less metaphorically relevant realms, like the Ant Caves and the... water pumping station? 
But anyway, these guards, and later these fleshy tentacles, serve as a persistent reminder of our destination. Of course, the Queen of Hearts, who upon meeting for the first time, we see is a faceless puppet sitting on the throne, merely a stand-in for Alice and her own self-loathing. Behind that, the embodiment of fear in its entirety, barely visible but layering all emotions inside one another. Although she is controlled by the player in similar vein as a Doom Marine, we also witness Alice cry only a small handful of times, brief enough to not be a helpless female, before she stands back up and soldiers on. A sentiment often used to rationalise trauma is to say that it made us stronger. That's poppycock. Trauma is a tragedy. It isn't why we are strong, but what made us weak in the first place. Strength only comes in what we do after, facing it and putting ourselves back together, fixing our own wonderlands. Perhaps the most fortunate part of this adventure is that for all the pain and destruction, it only ever impacts Alice herself, entirely imaginary as it was. Because quite often, these issues do not impact one person alone, but also those closest to them. Silent Hill 2, since release in 2001, has become popular in significant part for its late game plot twist, the Kaiser Soze of video games, if you know what I mean which makes it unfortunate for its biggest fans to lead with that information when trying to sell it to others. Even its inclusion in this video may have given too much away already, which is why I won't say anything else about it. Instead, I want to break chronological order and go back to its predecessor, because while the earlier title does have a character's mentality affecting environment, I think it has more interesting things to say about environment affecting the player's mentality. Before specifics though, I wanted to quickly address why video games are in fact the most effective medium for the horror genre. As you experience a scary story, it is very easy to panic, look away, make the wrong decision, or remove yourself from control entirely. It's the ingrained fight or flight response and it is universal for all living beings. Video games present a situation where you cannot lose control or else more scary things will occur, which means you are fighting your own physiology while your psychology wants to continue the game. Both fascinating to think about and a bastard to experience, which is why I am personally not a fan. Full disclosure, most other candidates I thought of for this topic share their focus on that side of the human experience, the mixture of anxiety and insanity, with Silent Hill being the best known and available. I can't comment further on their depictions of mental health, but I don't want to devalue them either. Please check them out as well. This is before we start to address the manipulative context of game design in general. With all that in mind, let us continue with the original Silent Hill game. The creators within Konami, labelled Team Silent, were a collection of staff who had previously worked on other games that had failed, throwing them together with a kind of last chance perspective. First time director Kichiro Toyama may not have worked specifically in horror games beforehand, but he did go on to create the Forbidden Siren franchise, much more drenched in Japanese horror than Silent Hill has ever been. As they were essentially living in their own version of isolation and unknown within the company, this did grant the team some freedom to make the main focus on imparting those psychological stresses through the game to the audience on the other side. I'll run through each technique one by one, starting of course with atmosphere. This may be my first time entering Silent Hill ever, but I have used the town's fog effects many times as an example of creative choices coming out of tighter limitations. The processing power of the original PlayStation console was very weak which honestly amplifies the more impressive titles that ever managed to complete development. 
The town of Silent Hill was originally intended to be quite detailed with long sight lines as you explored, but the hardware didn't allow both graphic detail and high quality audio at the same time, which as I'll discuss soon, audio was the higher priority. A modern game can just have high detail at further distance without regard, but this game, this development team, turned the low draw distance into a feature that enhances the claustrophobic scenario, both outside areas with the fog and inside with dark hallways, and it is beautiful. Well, not visually beautiful, but creatively beautiful. But honestly, who would want this to be more beautiful? The goal of high definition graphics is to get close study the textures and understand them visually. And you don't get horror that way. No, what you do is take the idea of an everyday location like a primary school and cover that with the textures of rusted metal and blood. From there, any level of detail is building onto how the familiar now feels unfamiliar, where less will add to vagueness and more will add to dissonance. Take for example the floor of this elevator, turning from marble to meat by changing a single colour. Works on misplaced objects as well. A hospital gurney in a filthy alleyway just is uncomfortable. What good is there in making these objects look any better when the confusion surrounding them is what haunts us? In exchange, the auditory side of sensory input is very intricate in Silent Hill. An important object in the game is a common garden radio, because as we all know, monsters naturally produce radio distortion. Travelling between areas, you grow accustomed to holding your breath, awaiting the crackle of danger, and sighing when it doesn't come. I didn't encounter this myself, but I've heard mention that this warning system does not hold up for the final area which, if true, is effective to unsettle precisely because you came to depend on it up to that point. But that is a positive use of sound, while a negative use would be everything else. The soundtrack was almost considered a glitch by the rest of the team until composer Akira Yameoka explained his process because this music verges on binaural torture. So as effective as it was, I won't be subjecting my audience to much of it. I've had enough of it myself in editing. Search on your own discretion, thank you very much. But really, the majority of playtime is in complete silence. Oh, I get it now. So that the set piece effects have extra impact. These aren't simple jump scares that spend the tension on you. They're descriptive sounds that imply something outside of vision leaving the facts up in the air to never be explained. Beyond those, there are a number of other tricks that the game will throw at you throughout just to emphasize the madness. The pacing of most levels goes from foggy streets to dark streets to normal interior to hellish interior, raising intensity as you grow accustomed to the previous, then resetting to start all over. Random doors switch your location on a whim. Important keys and items are placed behind the nastier scares to make them unavoidable. The camera angles for certain set pieces are fittingly disorientating, oh no. On to the narrative and theming. This is the majority of material that warranted the content warning at the start. Extra heads up. Last, and not not least, because it ain't that deep, bro. That's significantly why I spent so much time on development and presentation. For the amount of effort behind the scenes, what it amounts to is not much. I mean, I do have a lot to say about it, but it's more on game theory logic than what the game itself tells us, so please bear with me. Surely by this point, analysing our lead star Psyche would come back regularly to their fears and insecurities, here being those of seven-year-old Alessa, and they are fitting for your average unfortunate young girl. We get boss battles based on bedtime stories and bug collections, 
We get scenes of school isolation and scorn. We get rising flesh and rust from hospital recovery. And we get moved right along to the next alliterated area. I'm sorry, but the details surrounding her inner nightmares manifesting and infecting reality are sadly far more interesting than the nightmares themselves. That's not to say the whole thing becomes trash, or I wouldn't have gushed this much. Only a case of greater expectations. And for the sake of conversation, it's very lucky that the overall meaning and the in-moment tension seem to both fail around the same time. Out of about eight recurring foes to fight, the appropriate three are the sad ghost children in school and doctors and nurses in the hospital. Mm, sounds obvious. Fun fact, my PS3 download replaced the aggressive school variants for evil mole rats, and Alessa could have had kinophobia, but the rest are not metaphorical, not fun to fight, and quickly become annoying instead of terrifying. This game even has a water treatment plant as well, full of frog beasts, I think, and it feels kinda like a filler level that I honestly run through every time and still get lost. I mean, it tries to catch you out with this key in the water, but come on. Now, I did have about three paragraphs of plot explanation, but for brevity, it's a mix of drug trafficking, creature horror, and cult shenanigans. Beyond what we players do as Harry Mason searching for his adopted daughter Cheryl, all that backstory was delivered via news clippings and ghostly flashbacks, intentionally continuing the themes of unknown. As another development aside, the American release is left even more confused by excluding half the details of how Alessa received her injuries and subsequent nightmare projections her role in a god-birthing ritual which chained into an industrial explosion. Odd choice for censorship, but what do I know? Maybe that is where USA draws the line, between demonic impregnation and a child with third-degree burns. Now, I wrote that line as a joke, but yes, I can see how the realism of the latter could be harrowing to an audience. I could also rant about how harrowing the metaphor of the former could be to certain members of that audience, but let's not in this video. Tying it all back to psychology, this presents a unique scenario that displays environmental impact. You know, like how we started this section. Alessa has actually had two childhoods. One with horrible social and parental pressure forced onto her that resulted in her very soul splitting apart, and another as Cheryl with a far more loving and supportive family that eventually guides her into a redemption for the former. So what we actually witness throughout the narrative is the biological mother of one girl and the adoptive father of the other in conflict over the same child. And regardless of ending, the abusive parent thankfully fails. Are you serious? We just finished toilet training! To paraphrase an early inspiration of mine, a story can do a lot of dark things throughout, as long as it has a good ending that stays with the audience. Well, the canonical ending of Silent Hill does indeed follow this rule, but I don't think it was enough to offset the heaviness of the story preceding it. So, just like my praise for Walt Disney the man, would it be childishly naive of me to hope that another psychology game could be a little more upbeat. When I tell you that our third and final game contains figments of imagination, emotional baggage, memory vaults, mental cobwebs, brain collection, mind reading, thought bubbles, confusion, telekinesis, bad thoughts, personal demons, and 10 mental realms all as game mechanics, it may come across as quantity over quality. Well, yes, and no, uh, let me start again. 
2005's Psychonauts is a collectathon platformer, so yes, excessive amounts of items to find is to be expected. And as seriously as I still want to treat it, the sense of humour at times I would describe as light-hearted edginess. Our protagonist here is a young boy named Rasputin with psychic abilities to enter the minds of others. Environments in these minds aren't always massive, but they are densely detailed for storytelling as much as exploring. No, we aren't diving in as deeply to each psyche from now on. This game goes just deep enough to know one person as maybe a new friend before moving on to the next. Even our player character is painted in broader strokes. The son of an acrobat family discouraged from his love of psychic superheroes, but that's all we need to get going. And as for us, well, I have more to say about the interplay between these people, what they have to say about each other, and what the game has to say about all of them. Firstly, the structure is very episodic to accommodate the many changes of perspective. In fact, for a completely different medium, it does that thing that makes good television. A simple overarching plotline, the mysterious kidnappings at a summer camp, while each episode has a complete self-contained story of its own, such as the many misfortunes of an amateur theatre troupe. Of the ten mental realms I mentioned, three are those of the camp counsellors stable and curated for student access, with years of personal training for these people to show others exactly what they want to show, though still not perfect themselves. You are my own creation. I command you to stop. Two realms are in a state of conflict, outside forces disrupting any peace of mind to be achieved. These come in the form of a microchip implanted in Linda the Lungfish to abduct children and subliminal messaging for the security guard Boyd to burn down the asylum and erase evidence of said abduction. Another three are inflicted by mental illnesses amplified by the supernatural powers in this region, yet to come to terms with a specific moment of their past while being subjected to extreme mood swings of rage, jealousy and depression respectively. And the final two are in the collective unconscious, an amalgamation of different minds included just for narrative purposes, but demonstrative of how bizarre and creative the concept of combined mentalities could be. Drawing on the director's previous work yet again, Tim Schafer's history in the point-and-click adventure genre results in the second half of the game to be structured as a fetch quest to disguise ourselves in front of a hospital orderly with poor eyesight. Since the common solution for this type of gameplay often boils down to trading items around the world, this should similarly reduce Gloria, Fred and Edgar down to emotional puzzles for Raz to solve. But that doesn't happen. Puzzles within their world, certainly, but at that point their significance is unmissable. Because the strategy of this fetch quest requires us to understand these characters more intimately, they become multi-layered individuals, sometimes literally. They don't feel like, Great Anna Gadsby, a sewer that's relevant. They don't feel like NPCs in the background the same way that all the children from camp do. Then again, the young campers at Whispering Rock Psychic Summer Camp have their own lesson to teach us. In the early game, they can be found around the grounds, in various situations, playing with or bullying each other, and even trialling learnable powers for the player in a very clever game design technique. None of them get the same environmental development as the adults do, because they are still growing. Either their own coping mechanisms, or the long-term effects of the trauma they're facing in youth. I'm pretty certain this camp experience counts as trauma for a few of them. Isn't it just too romantic? Shh! You promised. No talking. <laughs> All jokes aside, I want to deck this kid. Raz's personal character arc could also serve as a demonstration of perhaps the most important rule for every parent and guardian. Not to dictate the child's growth, 
but instead show them a range of choices and encourage their own path. And we can use the children from our previously discussed games as exceptions that prove the rule. I remind you that Alessa has had two childhoods from extremely different upbringings, and so together with Cheryl can identify the more emotionally healthy one for herself. Alice may be a little older physically, but she was mentally stunted for many years after losing her family. Her game was that process of growing. And in Bizarro Serendipity, Raz has a lot in common with Harry Mason. Both are thrust into the complexities of another human, both eventually make things better for others, but also both have failed someone they tried to save. If you've heard of Psychonauts before today, you've very likely heard of the Milkman Conspiracy level, the symbolic inner workings of Paranoid Void. Well, this is how the level ends, in utter chaos as Raz awakens the Milkman alter ego who attacks every aspect of a healthy brain. With or without previous meddling from the villain of the main game, we do not have any positive impact on this man and we're forced to leave him to this fate. An earlier brain had tried to teach Raz the dangers of a mind out of control, that one should take care with what they do inside. And definitely by the end of the first game, this is one lesson he did not learn. Ah shit, I made it sad again. For anybody new here, my most regular output on this channel is a series called Ideas to Inspire Ideas, where I spitball narrative and production concepts in hopes that you take something I say and grow it into your own creative works. Well, since I've laid plenty groundwork in this video, I don't want to make a second one that ends up repeating a lot of my arguments. So consider this a mini ITII. The Mind of a Compulsive Liar where the environment shifts back and forth to reflect what they see as truth. The inferiority complex of a people pleaser, a deafening voice calls out unfair demands and forces them to respond in a cheerful manner. A narcoleptic world, where its day-night cycle is on such a short timer that it can interrupt objectives and cause other changes. Set pieces of dreamlike superpowers, High floaty jumps in one scene, while a terrifying slow run chase in the next. Maybe these only work as pieces of a compilation type game, or fleshed into a short indie title, but I at least hope I've shown enough evidence that there is more ways to show a video game character's inner workings than to just have them fight an obvious avatar. You can have a whole land of emotions to fight through or pull the player into the same mental state, or construct a brand new personalized gameplay system. The only limitation is in your head. Psychological narratives are not new. They existed decades before 1999, 2000 and 2005. Video games just needed their time to mature, same as any art form. Though there is a wider range and stronger interest in these stories today, to the degree that some random boy with no qualifications can play armchair therapist for 28 minutes straight. I know we shouldn't play armchair therapist in real life, it can be hard not to, but with the privilege to explore a fictional human's thoughts and feelings, past and present, inside and out, we may discover the best mindset for ourselves. Oh, and don't dismiss medication, that attitude helps no one.